dominates Pacific skies. Three years later, Japanese pilots are bailing out before Americans even pull the trigger. What happened wasn't better tactics, it was an engine war, and American radials went from laughing stock to immortal. They absorbed cannon fire and kept screaming. Mitsubishi's masterpiece became a death trap. And the secret? It's more brutal than you think. In the opening months of the Pacific War, Japanese confidence wasn't just high, it was stratospheric. The legendary Mitsubishi A6M0, powered by the Nakajima Sakai radial engine, had given Japan total air superiority from China to the Philippines. This 14-cylinder air-cooled marvel produced around 940 horsepower, weighed just 1,200 pounds, and gave Japanese pilots an agility advantage that made Allied commanders sweat bullets from Washington to Melbourne. But Tokyo's propaganda didn't mention the hidden cost behind that performance. The Sakai engine was a marvel of efficiency, but it was also built with razor-thin tolerances. Engineers at Nakajima had shaved weight off every possible component. Cylinder walls thinner than soda cans, cooling fins barely adequate for sustained power, and an oil system with almost no reserve capacity. It worked brilliantly until it didn't. When American forces recovered an intact zero from Akutan Island in June 1942, engineers at Wright Field couldn't believe what they were seeing. The single-speed supercharger offered peak performance at one altitude, but failed above or below that window. The engine's internals were so fragile, one mechanic reportedly said, This thing looks fast, but I wouldn't want to fly it into a storm, let alone a dogfight. Did you know? The Sakai ran on 87-octane fuel, while American engines were already standardized on 100-octane or higher. That limited compression ratios, supercharging capability, and ultimately how much power the engine could ever deliver. Try pushing it harder, and the engine risked destroying itself through detonation. Nakajima had built a spectacular engine, but for the war they wanted to fight. Quick strikes, short engagements, and a pilot corps trained to baby their machines back to base. But by 1943, the war had changed. The Americans were bringing heavier planes, bigger guns, higher octane, and an industrial base that wasn't interested in elegance. They were coming to crush the Zero and everything that powered it. While Mitsubishi was perfecting the art of doing more with less, American engine manufacturers were asking a fundamentally different question. What if we just built it stronger? Companies like Pratt and Whitney and Wright Aeronautical weren't interested in winning elegance contests. They wanted engines that could take punishment, deliver obscene amounts of power, and still fly home with half their cylinders shot to pieces. Enter the Pratt and Whitney R2800 Double Wasp. This wasn't just an engine, it was an 18-cylinder monument to American industrial might. At 2,400 pounds, it weighed nearly twice what the Seikai did, but that weight bought you something priceless. 2,000 horsepower out of the box, and with emergency war power, well over 2,400. Enough to outrun death itself. The R2800 powered the F6F Hellcat, F4U Corsair, and the P47 Thunderbolt three aircraft that would obliterate Japanese air superiority by 1944. But the real brilliance wasn't just the numbers. American engines featured things Mitsubishi's designers had rejected as unnecessary weight, two-stage superchargers for high-altitude performance, robust cooling systems that kept temperatures in check, and construction so durable that engines routinely survived direct hits from 20mm cannon shells. And if the R2800 was the hammer, the Wright R3350 duplex cyclone was the wrecking ball. This 18-cylinder beast would eventually produce up to 3,700 horsepower in its most advanced variants, nearly four times the output of the Sakai. It powered the B-29 Superfortress, the very bomber that would bring the war to Japan's doorstep with a vengeance. The difference in philosophy was stark. 
Japanese engines were precision instruments, finely tuned to a narrow performance band. American engines were industrial sledgehammers, designed to win ugly, survive anything and keep evolving with every production run. And here's the kicker. American engines achieved this not just through design, but through mass production. Factories like Pratt and Whitney's could turn out thousands of R2800s monthly, each one interchangeable, standardized and tested to destruction limits. Japanese engineers hand-fitted their engines in small batches. America stamped them out by the thousands and made them tougher every time. Here's where the story gets technical, but stick with us, because this is where Japan's defeat became mathematically inevitable. The secret source in American radial superiority wasn't just design, it was materials science that Mitsubishi could only dream about. American engine manufacturers had access to high-grade chromium, molybdenum and nickel alloys that simply didn't exist in Japan's resource-starved wartime economy. These alloys allowed American cylinders to withstand higher temperatures and pressures without deformation. When you're pushing 2,000 plus horsepower through an air-cooled radial, metallurgy isn't a nice-to-have. It's everything. The cylinder head of an R2800 could survive sustained operation at temperatures that would cause a Sakai cylinder to warp within hours. American crankshafts, forged from nickel-chromium steel, could handle torsional stresses that would snap Japanese counterparts like breadsticks. Even the seemingly mundane choice of valve spring materials gave American engines thousands more hours of reliable operation. Japan tried to compensate with clever design, but clever design can't overcome fundamental material limitations. As the war progressed and Japan's access to strategic materials evaporated, Mitsubishi was forced to use increasingly inferior alloys. By 1944, some Japanese engines were using recycled materials so poor that mechanics reported engines failing during routine maintenance tests. The metallurgy advantage cascaded into everything else. Better materials meant tighter tolerances could be maintained in service, Tighter tolerances meant less oil consumption and better sealing. Better sealing meant higher manifold pressures without blow-by. Higher manifold pressures meant more power. More power meant heavier aircraft with better armor and weapons could still outperform the lightweight Japanese fighters. It was a virtuous cycle that Mitsubishi had no answer for. If you're finding this deep dive into engineering warfare as fascinating as we do, smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. We've got more untold stories of how technology shaped history's greatest conflicts. Drop a comment telling us which engine you'd rather have strapped to your fighter. Elegant Japanese efficiency or American overbuilt power? Here's where American radial engine philosophy proved absolutely devastating, scalability. The Nakajima Sakai engine, which powered the iconic Mitsubishi Zero, was essentially maxed out from day one. Japanese engineers had squeezed every possible horsepower from the design, leaving virtually no room for growth. When the war demanded more altitude, more speed, or more durability, there was simply nowhere left to go. The Zero entered the war with about 940 horsepower. By 1945, the best versions, like the A6M5 using the Sakai 21, barely pushed 1,130 horsepower. And even that improvement came more from incremental tweaks than true engineering breakthroughs. Pilots even reported that later war zeros were less reliable, largely due to declining materials and overstressed engines. Now, look across the Pacific. The Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp started its service life at 2,000 horsepower in 1941. By 1945, with water injection and improved boost systems, it was pushing 2,800 horsepower, a 40% increase on the same basic architecture. Why? Because American engineers had designed it with huge safety margins and a long-term upgrade path from the beginning. 
The F-6F Hellcat, for example, entered combat in 1943 with an R-2800 producing 2,000 horsepower. By late in the war, pilots could activate water injection systems that temporarily boosted output to 2,400 horsepower, more than double what most Zeros could deliver. Japanese pilots flying Sakai-powered aircraft reported that the American fighters seemed to have unlimited power. And they weren't wrong. And it wasn't just raw power. American radials kept evolving. The Hellcat's single-stage, two-speed supercharger gave it reliable performance across a broad altitude range. But aircraft like the Corsair and Thunderbolt, equipped with two-stage, two-speed superchargers, could maintain full power well above 25,000 feet, while Japanese superchargers gasped for air above 18,000. That gave US pilots the luxury of choosing when and where to fight. Cooling systems advanced too. US engineers developed complex baffling and airflow systems that prevented hotspots and extended engine life. By 1944, R2800S in non-combat roles were reaching 1,000-hour overhaul intervals. Meanwhile, Japanese engines were often breaking down before 400 hours, especially with inferior late war materials and poor logistics. The bottom line, American radial engines didn't just outpower the Sakai. They outlasted, outclimbed, and outclassed them at every turn. Training manuals told one story, combat told another. In the Pacific, American radial engines proved their greatest strength. They were almost impossible to kill. Combat reports from the front are staggering. F-6F, Hellcats returned to their carriers with entire cylinders shot away. P-47 Thunderbolts flew over 200 miles after taking direct 20mm cannon hits to their R-2800 engines. F-4U Corsairs limped back to base with shredded cowlings and daylight visible through gaping holes. One Thunderbolt reportedly took over 200 bullet strikes and still landed safely. This wasn't luck, it was the result of brutal, deliberate engineering philosophy. American radial engines, particularly the Pratt and Whitney R2800 and Wright Cyclone series, were designed with survivability in mind. Each cylinder functioned independently. Lose one or two. You'd get vibration, reduced power, but the engine kept running. Air cooling eliminated the vulnerability of liquid cooling systems. Even better, the radial circular layout often meant that the engine itself acted as armor, shielding vital components like magnetos and oil lines behind the front row of cylinders. Japanese engines, by contrast, had almost no margin for error. Mitsubishi radials and liquid-cooled inline engines were engineered to razor-thin tolerances to squeeze out every ounce of performance. But that performance came at a cost. A single hit could rupture an oil or coolant line, leading to overheating and engine seizure in minutes. Liquid-cooled engines, like those used in the Kawasaki Ki-61, were especially fragile. A single punctured radiator meant almost certain failure. By 1944, Japan's operational aircraft readiness fell below 30%, while US squadrons consistently stayed above 70%. The psychological toll was severe. Japanese pilots flew defensively, knowing one burst could end them. American pilots fought aggressively, confident their engines would get them home. That confidence became a weapon in its own right. If you're loving this dive into engineering warfare, hit subscribe and ring the bell. More untold stories on how tech shaped history's greatest conflicts are coming. Comment below. Japanese efficiency or American overbuilt power, and stay tuned to learn how US radials baffled Japanese engineers mid-war. By 1943, the Pacific War had become an engineering contest, and Japan was bringing a knife to a gunfight. Pratt & Whitney alone was producing over 20,000 engines per year, with Wright Aeronautical adding thousands more. 
America was building high-performance engines faster than Japan could train pilots to fly them. But it wasn't just about numbers. What truly crushed Japanese hopes was America's speed of innovation. US manufacturers practiced continuous improvement at a pace that would impress modern tech companies. Engineers responded to every combat report, failure analysis, and pilot debrief. Issues discovered in battle were corrected not in years, but in months. The R2800 double WASP engine underwent over 30 major variants and hundreds of updates during the war. Pilots reported oil frothing at altitude, engineers redesigned the oil system and rolled it out fleet-wide. Maintenance crews struggled with cylinder access, new cowling panels were added in the next production run, damage revealed vulnerabilities in the accessory section, additional armor and redundancy followed swiftly. This rapid feedback loop became a weapon in itself. Field modifications were tested, standardized, and mass-produced at scale. Water injection systems, delivering up to 400 extra horsepower on demand, moved from prototype to full deployment in under a year. Fuel injection replaced carburetors across thousands of engines, eliminating negative G-fuel starvation. By August 1945, the verdict was unmistakable, American radial engines hadn't just outperformed their Japanese counterparts, they had redefined the very nature of air combat. What began in 1941 as subtle differences in engineering philosophy had, by war's end, transformed into overwhelming air superiority. The statistics told a brutal truth. The F-6F Hellcat, powered by the robust Pratt and Whitney R-2800, achieved an astonishing 19 to 1 kill ratio. The F-4U Corsair followed closely with an 11 to 1 ratio. Even the heavy P-47 Thunderbolt, less agile but nearly indestructible, maintained a 4.6 to 1 kill ratio, making it the most survivable fighter of the war. These weren't just planes, they were flying weapons systems built around engines so powerful and reliable that they reshaped air tactics. By 1945, Japanese pilots found themselves hopelessly outclassed. American fighters could outclimb, outdive, outaccelerate, and, perhaps most crucially, absorb damage that would destroy a Japanese aircraft. U.S. pilots could dictate the terms of engagement, choosing when to fight, when to break away, and when to press an advantage. They knew their engines would respond even under fire. Japanese pilots, by contrast, flew machines that offered no such confidence. Their engines, though refined, were fragile and unforgiving. Strategically, the impact was devastating. B-29 superfortresses, powered by four R-3350 duplex cyclones, bombed the Japanese mainland from high altitudes with near impunity. Japan's fighters simply couldn't reach or intercept them effectively. Air defense collapsed, not due to lack of bravery, but from lack of machinery that could compete. American radials crushed Japanese engines through brutal simplicity, overbuilt power that absorbed damage, upgraded mid-war, and flooded the Pacific faster than Japan could respond. The war wasn't lost in dogfights. It was lost in metallurgy labs and factory floors years before Pearl Harbor. What surprised you most? The metallurgy gap or production avalanche? Drop your thoughts below and smash subscribe for more untold tech warfare stories. Remember, the best engineering isn't always the prettiest. It's what works when everything's on fire.